Happy Father's Day to all of our dads here today. Would you give a hand for all of our dads, our fathers today? Amen. You are in the right place today. We're so glad that you are here. Glad that you are in the house with us today, uh, worshiping with us, and uh, for everybody watching online, hey, we're so glad that you're watching online, and let's get on into this word this morning. Uh, Matthew chapter number 7, we're going to start reading at verse number 7, and we'll go down to verse number 12, and let's look at this. Matthew 7 and 7 starts with, keep asking. Tell your neighbor, you got to be persistent. Yeah, if you're going to get persistent results, you have to have persistent actions. Keep doing it. Keep asking, and it will be given to you. What a promise right there. Keep searching, and you will find another profound promise. Keep knocking, and it will be open unto you. Look at verse 8 now. Say everyone. everyone. Now that includes you. <laughs> everyone who asks receives. Pause just for a moment. I've had so many people to say, I need you to pray about this. I'm like, why don't you pray about it? It's like, <laughs> it's like God, God's not answering me, but I believe he'll answer you. What's this? We ha wait, that's the wrong mindset. Everyone this is awesome. Everyone who asks receives. And then I started thinking about that, and I'm like, wait a minute, is that true? Everyone who asks receives. I'm like, it's in here, so it's got to be true. Everyone who asks receives. No, notice it, don't say in your timing. <laughs> Everyone who asks receives. And the one who searches finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Look at verse number 9. But what man of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? That's messed up. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? Somebody just say more. How much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask? Now, there's a key here in verse number 12. Often we stop there, but let's look at the next one. Therefore, see, every time you see the word therefore, always find out what it is there for. <laughs> because it's pointing to a key. It's pointing to a revelation. Therefore, whatsoever you want others to do for you, do also the same for them, because this is the law and the prophets. So, Father, thank you for the reading of your word. Help me to uh, articulate your word today in a way that would be pleasing uh, to you and glorify the resurrected Jesus. Holy Spirit, I thank you for the illumination of the word of God in our midst, that this word would become flesh and dwell among us, be activated in our lives, that we could walk it out. And, Lord, we give you all the praise for it in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. So now these are, these are red letter words. These are the words of Jesus himself. And he's teaching us a principle here. And it's a principle concerning our relationship uh, with our Father in heaven. First of all, it is how that we approach him and how that we view ourselves and how that we, rev how that we view him. He says, if you are evil, knowing how to give good gifts to your children, how much more does your Father in heaven know how to give good gifts? And he begins to use a couple of different analogies. If your child asks you for some bread, would you go outside and get some rocks and say, here you go, eat them? Absolutely not. Or if you do think that way, we, we, gotta, we got to help you. <laughs> <laughs> or if you ask for some fish, it's like, hey, I need some Captain D's. And you go out and get a rattlesnake. Here you go, eat this. And he's using this, these extreme analogies to show us, to say you wouldn't even treat your own children 
in this manner, and you're evil. But God being good, you have to see that if you know how to give good gifts to your children, God knows how as our Father, our Heavenly Father, knows how to give good gifts to those who are asking, those who are seeking, and those who are knocking. Psalm 8411 says it like this, No good thing will he withhold from those who walk upright before him. He's not looking to withhold. He is not the God who withholds. He is the God who gives. I love what Paul says, If God did not if, if he did not reserve his own son, we have to see, if he freely gave us his son, he will freely give us all things. You come to my house and, and, and you see something and you're like, oh man, I like that. I'm probably going to give it to you. But if you say, hey, I want to kill your son, I'm going to be like, you're crazy. I'm, I'm, we got problems. But God, somehow we think that he gave us his son, but he's withholding other things. That's not how a good father operates or deals. Uh, the Bible begins to speak to us in Galatians chapter number 4, 3 and 4, and teaches us that there's no difference between a servant and a son as long as the son is immature. But when the son begins to mature and grow, then there is a distinction because then the son is qualified for the inheritance through maturity. And a lot of times we want certain things from the Lord, and the Lord is saying, you're not ready for that yet. You're not mature enough for that yet you know when 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 my son was 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 four or five years old it would have been so foolish for me to give him the keys to the car and say hey take off go down to the store you know why? Because he wasn't mature. He wasn't ready. And there's a lot of things that we're waiting on God to do. And it's not about God doing it. It's about us growing up and maturing. And I know for years, for years we have, we have been talking about uh, as a whole in the church, uh, get ready, Jesus is coming, get ready, Jesus is coming, get ready, Jesus is coming. And I do understand that. I do get that. Jesus is coming. However, there are more scriptures about growing up than there are about going up. And maybe we need to have a focus on growing and maturing and not being children, as the word says, being tossed to and fro through every idle doctrine that we're growing up so that we can be ready to go up. Amen? So, I, I, I saw how low the amens got on that, but you got to mature. I know you've been saved 20 years. I know you've been saved 30 years. And you come here thinking that we're going to change your diaper. You're in the wrong place. We're here to grow you up. We're here to mature you. We're here to get the pacifier out of your mouth, the bottle out of your mouth. Uh, put some meat on the inside of you. Time to put your big boy unders on, your big girl unders on, uh, and say we're going to advance the kingdom of God in maturity. We're not going to be a bunch of M mature Christians or believers uh, we're gonna uh, the goal is Jesus he's the model that's where that's what we're striving after mature sons and daughters operating in the fullness of the father's kingdom here on this earth so that it be just on earth in our lives like it is in heaven right here right now somebody say amen Psalm 35, 27 says it like this. He takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. It makes him happy to prosper. The word prosper is nothing missing, nothing lacking, nothing broken. It makes him happy when he looks at us and sees that there is nothing missing, nothing lacking, nothing broken. And I'm calling out to him and I'm saying, I want to make you so happy. I want to make sure there's nothing missing, nothing lacking, nothing broken in my life so you can be so happy. This is for your benefit, God. This is for your benefit. He says, keep asking. Keep seeking and keep knocking. What does this mean? Ask, seek, knock. How do we walk this out in our lives every day? Notice he says, everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. 
But you say, wait, wait, wait a minute, Pastor, I, I prayed about this, and, and, and it didn't happen. Well, I want to take you back to the theology, good theology, of Garth Brooks <laughs> in the song, I Thank God for Unanswered Prayers. Because that's, that's some good theology right there all by itself. Because there's a lot of things that we're praying for right now that you're going to look back 20 years from now, 10 years, and you're going to be very thankful that he didn't answer that prayer because that was not a good thing for you right now. And he withheld the bad thing so that he could set you up for the good thing. I want to prophesy to you this morning, and some of you think that God's holding something back from you. He is. He's holding the bad thing back from you and setting you up for the good thing. Come on now, give him some praise. He's worthy. <laughs> Uh, some of y'all are just too religious for Garth, aren't you? <laughs> uh, but he says, if your son asked for a fish, would you give him a snake? Come on. I remember when we were growing up, my dad had uh, such a sense of humor. He still does. And uh, I know I'm going to get in trouble for this later. And just like I tell stories of my mom and I get in trouble for her, and she's like, she'll call me up the next day and she'll be like, why did you say that? Why did you say that? And so I, I, I do get in trouble often. But, but I, I, I got to share it because it's so funny. It's so good. I remember when we were growing up, my dad and, 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 and mom had a, had a great sense of humor. And uh, my youngest brother, Joe, um, he, he had won this board game. That was called Mousetrap. Y'all remember that? It, it, I mean, they were doing so many commercials on TV about this board game, Mousetrap. I mean, they showed the thing, how, how, the, how, how, how the little trap would come down and trap you on the board game. And it looked like so much fun. All these kids were playing. It looked like they were having a blast. And my baby brother was like, okay, I only want Mousetrap for Christmas. So you know what my mom and dad did, right? They went and bought a four-pack of mouse trousers and wrapped it up. And now they bought him the real one too, but they let him open the package of real mouse traps. And they gave them to him, and he opened it up, and it's like, "Mom, you know what I meant? You know what I, you know?" And then they brought out the real one. But then my my baby brother starts working on their mind because they go to get the mouse traps. To, to actually use in the house because we needed them. And, and he's like, no, these are mine. You got them for me. So, and, 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 and it's funny to see that when we're dealing with God and understanding the ways of God, is he's not a trickster. He's not a prankster. He's not withholding. He is a good, good father who is taking pleasure in our shalom, in our nothing missing, nothing lacking, nothing broken. And how much more will your father in heaven give good things to those who ask, this is a plan with protocol and, 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 and persistence here. He says, ask the Father, seek the kingdom, and you knock on those doors that are closed. So number one we want to look at this morning is what questions are you asking your Father in heaven? With this mindset, remember when you ask, he's a good Father who loves to give you Good gifts. If you're asking for bread, he's not going to give you a rock. If you're asking for a fish, he's not going to give you a snake. He's a good father. Now, now every, every quest begins with a question. So it starts with the question. Every quest begins with that question. In the New Testament, Jesus asked 308 questions. And he answered four of those. <laughs> When Jesus was 12 years old and he was teaching in the temple, the rabbis, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the whole religious sect, they were not amazed at the answers that he was giving, but they were amazed by his questions. And most of the time, the questions that we're asking God is the why question. It's like, this happened. Why? That happened. Why? Why is this going on, God? And I love what Graham Cook said. Graham Cook said, God is rarely going to 
answer the why question because most of the time the why question comes from a place of a victim's mentality and he refuses to see you as a victim. So every time you're asking the why question from a victim's mentality, most of the time you're not going to get a response from that simply because he refuses to view you as a victim. And if God refuses, your father refuses to view you as a victim, you should refuse to view yourself as a victim. I am not a victim. I am victorious. I am the head. I'm not the tail. I'm above. I'm not beneath. I'm blessed coming in. I'm blessed going out. Does anybody know what I'm talking about this morning? We refuse to see ourselves as victims. So instead of asking the why question from a victim's perspective, maybe we should be asking, what's missing here? What do you want to be for me in this moment? What? What do you want me to do? How do I partner with you for brilliant solutions in this circumstance? You see, because the quality of the question determines the quality of the conversation. In Acts chapter number 2, on the day of Pentecost, there were two questions that's asked that I think is always worth asking. Number one, what does this mean? And number two, what do we got to do? When you're seeing something going on in your life, God, what does this mean? And what do I got to do about it? How do I partner with you for brilliant solutions in this thing right here? And a lot of times my prayer is, Holy Spirit, what question am I supposed to be asking right now? Because obviously I do not know what question to ask right now. I've also learned about questions is that when God asks you a question, it's not because he doesn't know the answer. Just like your mama <laughs> and your daddy. When they ask you a question about something, it's not because they don't know the answer. It's because they already know, and they're going to see if what you're going to say is going to line up with what they already know. Y'all just look straight ahead. Just look straight ahead. Number two, what are you looking for? So what questions are you asking? Number two, what are you looking for? What are you searching for in life? What are you searching for in marriage? What are you searching for in family? What are you searching for in business? What are you searching for in life? It was one of the most repeated questions that's asked all through the Bible, Old Testament and New. What are you looking for? Jesus asked that question to the disciples. What are you looking for? Before they became disciples, he's like, what, what, do, you, what do you want? What are you looking for? Jesus says in Matthew 6, he teaches us his priority with a promise. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else is added. So my priority is to seek. That means to pursue, to discover, to pursue, to understand, and to apply. Seek the kingdom of God and righteousness. The kingdom of God is God's way of doing something in simplified terms. And righteousness is correct alignment with authority. I want your kingdom to be manifested in my life, and I want to be in correct alignment with authority. Have you ever noticed that, that when you are out of alignment with, with, with authority, that fear begins to set in? In other words, let's put it like this. You're running 85 down 75. <laughs> <laughs> the speed limit is 70. You see the authority. Boom. Heart drops. Break. Slam. I mean, you're like, you know that you're out of alignment with authority. So you're trying to quickly fix the out of alignment so that you don't get a ticket. You know what I'm talking about? When you know that you are in right alignment with God, the word says that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We're not righteous and in correct alignment because we did everything right. We are righteous and in correct alignment because Jesus did everything right. And he's our Lord. He's our Savior. We're walking in that righteousness. You're always going to find what you're looking for. What are you looking for? 
What are you looking for? You're always going to find what you're looking for. If you're looking for a reason to be afraid, you're going to find reasons to reinforce that fear. If you're looking for reasons to hope, you're going to find reasons that reinforce that hope. Whatever you look for, that's what you're going to find. That's why we, we look at different prophets, Old Testament, New Testament, current prophets today. Prophets, what I've learned about studying the lives of prophets is this. Prophets often run their prophecies through a filter of their belief system or their life experiences or their worldview. That's why some prophets are prophesying even today gloom, doom, oh, everything. You think it's bad now. It's about to get worse. You better, you better store up stuff. You better get your guns. You better get your food. You better get your, and it's like, oh, yeah, it's, it's going to get bad. It's going to get worse. It's a, and then on the other side, I mean, I'm talking about authentic prophets who are known for accurate words. And then you get the, on the other side of the spectrum, which, which where I like to say is like, man, this is the time where the glory of God is going to be seen. It's time to arise and shine. Let your light shine. This is that day. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh, your sons and your daughters. You know, you, know, you see all of this. You see all of this. Jeremiah prophesied about the captivity of Israel. But then Daniel, Micah prophesied about the release of those who are who were in captivity which one was right they both were there are two sides to the coin but the, I'm, I'm here to tell you you're going to experience what you are looking for if you have faith to believe God for death and destruction and loss and suffer that's, that will be the experience of your life. But if you know that Jesus came to make a way to set the captives free, come on. Often people want to pull out the prophecies of end times that say there's going to be wars and rumors of wars, famines, earthquakes, pestilence. Yes, all of that's true. But there's also prophecies from Hosea that says in the end of days, uh, men are going to come to know the Lord in great droves because they will see his goodness poured out on the earth and it will cause them to run to him. There are also prophecies that say in the end of days that he pours out his spirit of on all flesh it does say that in the end of days that gross darkness covers the earth but in the middle of the darkness finish the prophecy the light of the glory of the Lord begins to radiate and shine on the people of God you can't stop at the negative you got to go on to what else God said and then you say okay what am I looking to experience in my life am I looking to experience the lack the plagues, or am I looking to see the glory and the goodness of God because there are two sides to the coin and you have a choice in what you get to experience. What do you have faith for? Some people have more faith to run out than they do have to run over. I, look, I like what Jesus said, I've come to give you life. And so that you can have life in the full until it overflows. Remember what Jesus said? We are the good news people. We're not the sad news people. We're not the depressed news people. We're not the bummer news people. We're the good news people of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's saying, yes, right now the kingdom is at hand within reach. What are you looking for? Number three, what, what, what doors are you knocking on? Typically, we don't knock on doors that are open. We just go through them. But doors that are closed, he gives us protocol. What do we do in the natural? When we go to, to an office, when we go to a place and the door is closed, we knock and we wait. We knock and we wait. Sometimes we holler, hey, is anybody in there? <laughs> we knock and we wait. Look, there's a, a thing in persistence here. Sometimes I think we see closed doors and we don't even knock. We just turn around and say, what's the use? What's the use? See, you can go through life with keys 
or crowbars. There's some doors that you can probably get open with some crowbars. And you can be like a bulldozer, bulldozing your way through life with crowbars. But eventually you will get to some doors that can't open with the crowbar that you got to use some keys. And Jesus gives us some keys right here. Knocking announces, I want to come in. What's behind the door that you're knocking on right now? Have you already given up on knocking on the door because the door was closed or the door was shut in your face? How persistent are you willing to be? Y'all ain't talking back to me now. How persistent are you willing to be when you're standing before a door that you know that God put you in front of? How persistent are you willing to be to wait, to be patient, to not to follow the protocol till the door begins to open. Fourth thing that we see here in this is what you want others to do for you, do the same for them. You can't talk about, God, I need favor. And then somebody else is trying to get favor with you and you won't show them favor. You're wanting God to open up a door for you. But you can't open up a door for somebody else. See, he says the same way, the same way that you want others to do for you, do for them. You want everybody to show you respect, but you don't want to respect nobody. You want everybody to talk to you, but you don't want to talk to nobody. You want everybody to be nice to you, but you want to be hateful to everybody. Y'all getting quiet again. But he says, the same way that you want others to do things for you, start going out of your way to make some stuff happen for other people. And watch how that becomes a key in your life to, to receiving open doors. All through the Bible, we see different fathers, some good, some bad. We see Adam, the father of the human race. Abraham, the father of the Israelites and the father of faith. Jacob, the father of the 12 tribes. Uh, the servants of Naaman actually called him father. The king of Israel called Elisha father. Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this, our father. He's given us, he's given us a protocol. He's given us a mindset to see something here about our Heavenly Father and the application that he, that he wants us to walk in in our life. I was thinking about this and I thought, you know, probably Joseph was the most underrated father in the Bible. He's the foster father of Jesus Christ. Probably the most underrated father in the Bible because he chose to raise a child that he knew wasn't his. Imagine, imagine, put yourself in this scenario. You're men, walk with me through this. Women, close your ears just for a minute. Men, walk with me through this. You are engaged. Your fiance comes up to you and says, yo, I'm pregnant and the baby's not yours. What are you going to do? Yeah, y'all, y'all look straight ahead. You know what you would do. You would do what Joseph was trying to do. He's like, I got to get out of this thing. This is done. It's over. But he, but, but it says that he wanted to be as discreet as possible dealing with man. He went trying to post, post it on Facebook. He went. <laughs> Can y'all believe what she did to me? Yeah, he went trying. He. he there, there are certain solutions that are only going to come to you when you make up in your mind, I'm going to handle this as discreet as possible. Even though, <laughs> man, even though everything was going on, he's like, I'm going to handle this discreetly. We're going to handle this. What we learned from Joseph, a good father, is that mercy always wins. Aren't you glad that God was merciful with us, with you, with I? Number two that we learn about Joseph is this. Obedience may lead to humiliation from men, but it leads to friendship 
with God. What if obedience means being humiliated before all of your friends, before all of your family, and nobody in your family or friends understand why you're doing what you're doing, but God knows why you're doing what you're doing because you're listening to Him. What if the friendship with God costs you humiliation with others? Are you willing to be humiliated? Oh, look how low the amen's got again. You guys, you guys are doing so good. Are you willing to be humiliated? One time the Lord a- asked me something and, 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 and actually told me something and I wasn't really happy about. And he said, you're more concerned about your reputation than you are my reputation. I'm just being transparent with you. <laughs> and I'm like, I am. That is so true. What if, what if we just forget about our reputation and forget about what everybody else thinks or cares about us and saying, as for me and my house, I got to follow what God's saying. I have to listen to his voice. I have to walk out. You, 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 you might not understand why I'm doing, but I have to walk in obedience to what God has revealed to me. And if it humiliates me in front of you, So that I get friendship with him, I'm going to take friendship with him every single time. We learn from Joseph as a father that God honors men of integrity. And he rewards them with trust. Every human father is a son of God. The most high father. Jesus is the perfect son. I've come to the realization that he has no problem being a good father. But we sometimes have a problem understanding what it means of being a good son and good daughters. And my prayer is, God, help me to be a good son. Help me. I want to be like Jesus. Jesus is the perfect. He's the perfect son. That's our goal. That's our goal. I'll close with this. Uh, I went through about eight fathers in, in the Bible who really were, were terrible fathers. And, and, and there's three characteristics of the terrible fathers that I saw in Scripture. And I think it's true for even our lives today. All, all of these men who failed as fathers had three things in common. Number one, they neglected our chi- their children. You don't have to have the perfect answer, the perfect solution, the perfect, perfect, perfect to be an awesome dad. 99% of being a dad is just showing up. Come on now. Come on now. Take the pressure off. 99% of it is showing up. Showing up. They neglected their children. They showed favoritism. And they refused to discipline or correct them. You know, I don't know how many times that I've had to set my children down, Parker and Paige, when they were small, and when I had made a very bad call about something in their life, that Holy Spirit corrected me and said, hey, Michael, you know that's wrong. I'm like, yeah, but I did it. (laughs) I got to show that boy. I got to show her, you know, this is, you know, you don't do this in this house or whatever. And, And Holy Spirit be like, that's wrong. And I'm telling you, I, I, I don't know how many times I have went to them and, and said, you know what, I really messed up when I was disciplining you and talking to you about this situation. You know, as dads and moms, it's okay to admit to your son or daughter that you were wrong. And I know sometimes pride will prevent you from doing that, but are you willing to be humiliated in the moment to gain a relationship to see something restored back in your family? Are you willing to be humiliated and say, I messed up, I was wrong? I wish I could say, I'm the pastor. I am so awesome. I'm perfect. I do everything right. Listen to me. This is, listen. That would be cool to do that. But, I, but, but that would be lies. 
I, what would be honest was to say, I'm a human being just like you, trying to figure out how to walk out the call of God, the will of God, the plan of God. Sometimes I may make some bad calls dealing with you that I have to come back and say, I was wrong with that. I need you to forgive me over that. Does that make me less of a leader? No, no. That just says, hey, I'm willing to admit if I mess up, I'm going to own it. And when you mess up, you got to own it. You just got to say, hey, this is, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm learning to work out, as the scripture says, my salvation with fear and trembling. Let me just agree that you ain't got it all figured out yet. <laughs> Man, you are in the right place. This is a bunch of people who don't have it all figured out yet. But together we're learning to hear the voice of God and to walk out His will and His plan for our lives. Thank you.